Hey everybody, Ryan here, emergency medicine pharmacist and clinical toxicologist. I am here to bust some myths about ibuprofen and coronavirus. If you've been on the internet in the last few days, you've probably seen a ton of confusing information about whether we should be using ibuprofen to treat fevers or muscle aches or whatever for coronavirus. And it's even more confusing because some medical societies have made recommendations and then taken them back. So I'm going to explain what we know and what we don't know and whether we should be using any of that to influence how we treat coronavirus. This will be a two part video. This first video is going to focus just on NSAIDs and coronavirus. And the second video will look at using NSAIDs in general for treating viral infections. This is a video for the public and for medical professionals. So we might get into the weeds a little bit with the science, but I'll try to define and explain everything along the way so everyone can follow along. Lastly, if there's anything that I missed or anything you want to talk more about, leave a message in the comments below or uh, contact me on Twitter at EMPoisonPharmD. Okay, let's go. We'll actually start with the takeaway for those who don't have the time or attention span to watch the whole video. It's likely too early to make any changes in NSAID prescribing just due to the COVID-19 disease. We don't know how NSAID use can impact ACE2 in otherwise healthy individuals who are taking infrequent doses. If you don't know what ACE2 is, watch the rest of the video. We don't yet know how ACE2 even impacts COVID-19. It could be bad from increased infectivity or it could actually be good from reduced pulmonary inflammation. We need way more clinical outcome data, looking at patients who have taken NSAIDs and evaluating their severity of disease with COVID-19. So don't make any changes without talking to your doctor, especially for long-term NSAIDs like aspirin that you're taking for cardiovascular health and reducing your risk of stroke or heart attack. Lastly, NSAIDs may still be a viable option for patients that need fever or pain reduction, but we need to be aware of their risk profile that they've always had. And for that, you'll wanna look more into the second video. Okay, so for those who wanna know more, follow along. So we're gonna define a few things before we get started. SARS-CoV-2 or NCOV-19, that's the actual coronavirus. COVID-19 is the name for the disease that is caused by the coronavirus. And NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, very common ones that most people know about, ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, as well as aspirin. These are all drugs that inhibit a specific enzyme in the body called cyclooxygenase. We'll talk a little bit more about it. So our story really starts about 20 years ago in 2000 when we discovered a super important enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme 2. It was the counterpart to an enzyme that we've known about for a long time called ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme 1. ACE turns angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, which is a pro-inflammatory uh, blood vessel constricting molecule. Uh, it's responsible for a fair amount of diseases or contributes to diseases like hypertension, high blood pressure. And this ACE2 uh, enzyme actually degrades angiotensin 2. So it chops it up. It takes off two peptides and turns it into angiotensin 1-7, a anti-inflammatory blood vessel relaxing peptide. So this one is good. So ACE2 counteracts the effects of ACE1, and that'll be important later. A few years after its discovery, it was found that ACE2 is the binding site for corona type viruses so that they can latch onto the cell and actually get in and start replicating. And in 2020, this year, right around January, Juan and colleagues uh, determined that ACE2 is the most likely docking site for our current strain of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. On March 11th of 2020, a medical journal called Lancet published a letter to the editor where the authors observed that more of the patients who were dying had diseases like coronary heart disease, diabetes, or high blood pressure that would be treated with drugs that can increase ACE2, that protein we talked about. Despite the fact that these are also diseases that are very common in the elderly, and we know elderly are more likely to experience mortality with coronavirus, the authors concluded that the increase in ACE2 from drugs used to treat these diseases might influence disease severity. And they quoted drugs like ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and these are types of blood pressure medicines, as well as ibuprofen and NSAID. 
Now, there's actually a lot of things that can change around our ACE2 expression. Some diseases like diabetes and inflammation can decrease it. Angiotensin II, that molecule that ACE is supposed to chew up, ACE, angiotensin II can also decrease ACE. And a lot of things can increase ACE as well, such as certain diabetic medications, other NSAIDs, and diuretics and blood pressure medicines. So on March 14th, the French Minister of Health tweeted that taking anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or cortisone could aggravate COVID. And if you have a fever, you should take paracetamol, which here in the US is acetaminophen. Apparently this was spurred by four anecdotal cases where young patients with COVID-19 became critically ill and the doctor who was caring for them reported that they were all taking NSAIDs, but this isn't really confirmed. Either way, the British Medical Journal picked up this story and said top doctors and scientists say ibuprofen should not be used for managing symptoms. On March 17th, the World Health Organization spokesperson Christian Lindmeier, when being questioned by reporters about the French uh, Minister of Health's tweet, as well as the Lancet editorial, stated, well, we're looking into this, but in the meantime, why don't you use acetaminophen instead of ibuprofen as a self-medication? And less than 24 hours later, they walked that recommendation back and said, actually, we don't recommend against the use of ibuprofen. We're not really sure what the data is. But other organizations like the UK's National Health Service say there's no strong evidence that ibuprofen can make COVID-19 worse. But until we know more, take acetaminophen or Tylenol to treat the symptoms of coronavirus. And the FDA says we're not aware of any scientific evidence, but we're looking more into it and we'll let you know if we find anything. So with all these conflicting guidelines and statements that are made and then redacted, it's pretty easy to see how there's a lot of confusion. Add in a little bit of viral misinformation like this guideline release from the Society of a Friend Whose Sister is a Nurse on COVID-19 Treatment, and you'll see that Tylenol is getting taken off the shelves faster than it can actually be produced. So what exactly is going on in this scenario? Well, one thing that is probably right is that NSAIDs can probably increase ACE2, that protein that lets viruses dock to the cell. The body normally takes this molecule called arachidonic acid and metabolizes it via an enzyme called cyclooxygenase to these compounds called prostaglandin inside the kidney. Those compounds lead to a couple of downstream effects, but overall it leads to production of angiotensin 1, and that's the molecule that gets cleaved by ACE into the inflammatory molecule angiotensin 2. So NSAIDs, by pretty much definition, have to block the activity of cyclooxygenase, and thus they prevent angiotensin production and we decrease angiotensin II. And if you remember, angiotensin II is a down regulator of ACE2, so without angiotensin II, ACE2 can increase. Let's just stop here for a minute and define what an NSAID is. Like I said, it's a molecule that blocks cyclooxygenase. They prevent the production of inflammatory molecules. Common over-the-counter ones are ibuprofen, naproxen, and aspirin. But some people might be on prescription ones like meloxicam, indomethacin, celecoxib, or ketorolac. Some also claim that acetaminophen is an NSAID because it has effects on cyclooxygenase in the brain. And it does decrease prostaglandin similar to other NSAIDs, but it doesn't really work at the kidneys, so we wouldn't expect it to increase our ACE2. Now, animal studies do seem to support that NSAIDs can increase ACE2. Rats, when given inflammatory arthritis and randomized to one of four NSAIDs or nothing at all, compared to a control group, showed that inflammatory arthritis reduced ACE2 in all rats. And if we gave rats NSAIDs, their ACE2 reduction was not as severe and it was sometimes increased. But it looks about the same as the control group, so it's not necessarily clear that NSAIDs in a healthy individual would raise ACE2 levels beyond uh, what they normally are. And this has been shown in other disease states as well, like diabetes. So rats with induced diabetes, randomized to ibuprofen control, or a diabetic medication called pioglitazone for eight weeks, and then compared to control, showed very similar results. So the diabetes group had lower levels of ACE2, and the diabetes plus ibuprofen group had slightly higher levels of ACE2, as well as pioglitazone. 
but not as high as the control group by itself. So once again, it's not clear how this affects a normal healthy person who's taking ibuprofen. And do note that both of these studies used a minimum of seven days in this one up to eight weeks, not necessarily the same as someone taking ibuprofen every once in a while for fever or pain. So how does ACE2 upregulation even impact the SARS-CoV-2 virus or and COVID-19? Well, some think that upregulation increases infectivity. Normally, when NCoV-19 binds to the ACE2 receptor on your cell, it then gets sucked into the cell and begins replicating its DNA, which can then be sent out to other cells and increase infection. So if you have more ACE2 receptors, you increase the likelihood that NCoV-19 will collide with one, and uh, maybe more NCoV-19 uh, viruses can actually enter the cell. However, we don't actually know if that's the case. And in fact, downregulation of docking proteins is actually good for some viruses. HIV secretes a downregulating protein when it attaches to the cell that tells the cell to bring that receptor back inside. And this helps the virus get inside the cell and prevents other strains of HIV from entering the cell and causing this strain to have to compete for viral replication. SARS-CoV-2 also downregulates ACE2 when it attaches to the cell. And some think that that may actually be one of the causes of the more severe portions of disease from COVID-19. Remember, ACE2's normal function is to metabolize that pro-inflammatory molecule angiotensin 2 into an anti-inflammatory one. So if NCoV-19 has attached to our ACE2 receptor and forced it into the cell, angiotensin 2 can run amok in the lungs, causing inflammation and damage. If you have upregulated angiotensin converting enzyme 2, then even if there is NCoV virus attached to some of your ACE2 receptors, you probably still have more available to metabolize your angiotensin 2 and prevent inflammation. Additionally, it's possible that some of your ACE2 receptors will break off and go into solution so they can go metabolize angiotensin 2, and on the way they might intercept an NCoV virus that's trying to reach your cell and prevent it from cellular entry. So via these lower inflammation pathways and possibly preventing cellular entry, uh, they might actually be beneficial in COVID-19 disease. This is actually supported by animal studies where if you take rats with influenza and you look at ones that have no ACE2 molecules, meaning they can't get rid of any angiotensin 2, compared to control rats, you see far more lung injury in the ACE2 knockout rats compared to control. And this effect is reduced when you give those rats soluble angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So for these reasons, some authors have postulated that you could use drugs that increase ACE2 expression, like angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, to increase the amount of ACE2 and hopefully reduce inflammation. Or you can use soluble ACE2, administer it to patients, and hopefully bind the virus before it reaches the cell membrane and be able to metabolize off all the angiotensin II that's produced. So what do we know? Well, based on the NSAID mechanism, it does appear reasonable that they could increase ACE2. And animal experimental data supports this. But keep in mind the animal studies were usually with greater than seven days of exposure, and every animal already had a disease that affected ACE2 to begin with. It's not clear what the impact is of acute use of NSAIDs on healthy individuals. And recognize that animal data does not equal human data. There is no human literature evaluating the impact of NSAIDs on ACE2 expression. And some drugs like ACEs and ARBs have shown positive effects on ACE2 in animals, but variable effects on ACE2 in humans. We can't exactly extrapolate. Complicating things even more is that we don't even know if ACE2 regulation modifies the disease in a positive or negative way. We need to observe this phenomenon in clinical data, but the clinical data is not existent. There are no randomized control trials on the use of NSAIDs in COVID-19, no studies registered with clinicaltrials.gov that evaluate the impact of NSAID use on COVID-19, 
and none of the large cohort trials or observational studies or interventional trials of possible antivirals have made any mention of whether or not their patients used NSAID. So we can't really even extrapolate from other data. So that's what we know. And we need to know a lot more before we can really draw any conclusions about how NSAIDs or any drug that might increase ACE2 affects COVID-19. All we have right now are theories and theories constantly get proven wrong by good scientific testing. I do wanna make a note here. Other drugs like ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which are types of blood pressure and heart medicines, have also been shown to increase ACE2, so the same concerns are shared with those. But as you can see, we have no idea how ACE2 impacts COVID-19. And basically every medical society has come out and said, do not stop taking your heart and blood pressure medication. Because if you have untreated underlying disease, you're probably more likely to do worse with the virus anyways. So please don't stop taking your medications. Please talk with your doctor if you have any concerns. So are NSAIDs completely risk-free for using an upper respiratory infection? Well, no, but these are the risks that they've always carried. It has nothing to do with COVID-19. So if you want to know more about who is and who isn't a good candidate for using NSAIDs, that'll be in the next video. The link is going to be in the description below. And as well as all the studies that I cited in this presentation, you'll find them listed alphabetically in the description in case you want to pull one and read it yourself. If I missed something or a key study was omitted or you have thoughts or ideas about this as well, feel free to leave some comments uh, in the, on the video below or reach out to me on Twitter at EMPoisonPharmD. I hope this was helpful and thanks for watching. Hey, little update here, guys. Apparently, I can't list all the references on the YouTube description because there's too many words. So I'm listing the reference slides here. Feel free to pause the video and look through. They're listed alphabetically. So if you do want to take any of the references, they're all listed here for you. All right. Thanks for watching.